Okay, again, this is video is part of a series. Be sure to check out the link in the description of this video or uh, at the end of this video for the full playlist. I do recommend watching the previous videos uh, before watching this one, but you can do whatever you want. Um, so, we've been working on um, transmitting information through airwaves, through radio waves, through using audio uh, communications. Uh, again, the scenario here is you are working for emergency rescues, either firefighter or EMS or something along those lines, uh, and your normal for cor forms of communication, the internet, are down. This happened to me. I am a firefighter. This happened a couple months ago when Hurricane Irma came through, uh, through the storm. Uh, we lost internet, which normally we have computers in the truck that tell us where we're going, you know, it gives us the dispatch information. And our regular radio system went down, which uses the towers around town, but we still had some radios that communicated directly to each other. And the way they set it up is there was someone dispatching, they'd call one state, you know, call the over the radio and the closest station could hear them and then they would transmit over to somebody else. And that's great doing it verbally, but it'd be great if we also had that digital, that computer interface so that, uh, you know, we don't have, if we're writing stuff down, we can also confirm on the screen that we're seeing the same thing. If we wrote down the address wrong or the computer showing wrong information, just two forms of those communications. And plus you can back reference what you've been dispatched to in case you didn't hear something on the radio, you missed something, you can look on the computer and confirm that address over the radio. So that's what we're doing. Last video, we did it with the shell interface. This time we're going to do a GUI interface. I'm going to still do a shell interface for the dispatch, but as far as the client, the trucks out in the field, they will have this uh, relatively nice uh, GUI interface right here, which is written in HTML with a little tiny bit of JavaScript. To get this code, go to github.com forward slash mailx1000. There should be a link to that in the description of the video. Go to my repositories and then search for radio and you'll want the one that says radio transmissions. All the scripts from this entire series uh, should be in here. Mini modem, Morse code. Last time we did server one, now we're going to do server two. So that's the code here. You can see we just have a couple of uh, little scripts here. and you'll want to download that, either clone it using Git or download the zip file and unzip it. I'll be using Debian Linux for both my client and server here. And the client will have to have BusyBox installer our system, which is very simple to get. Uh, you know, you can use your package manager uh, if it's not already installed, but BusyBox is very simple to get. Um, you know, just sudo apt install BusyBox. Okay, BusyBox is a small uh, binary application that actually has a bunch of core programs in it. You can see this is a list of the, the uh, programs right here that they, they have built in. Uh, and of course you can trim it down to have just a few of those. And it's something that, that runs on pretty much everything. It probably is already on your TV, your router, your modem, and your phone, unless they're using Toybox, which is a similar application with different licensing. Uh, but go ahead and have that installed. Once you've downloaded uh, the code from GitHub, uh, you're gonna want to move into the server two folder, which I am here. So here we're gonna have the top screen, bottom screen. These are both the same computer, but we're gonna pretend for right now that they're two different computers. And in a later video, we will demonstrate it communicating between two different computers over radio waves using different types of radios. List out here, you can see that we have our CAD file, which if you watched the previous video, is our file in, file out. And we'll see that in our dispatch code. Uh, and actually, let's real quick, let's just look at our, oops our dispatch code and you can hear you can see our CAD file we're creating it here and we're dumping our transmission message which is received here nothing has changed from our uh, our client to our, I'm sorry from our last project to this one besides the fact that I removed the new line character these uh, equal signs from the from what's being transmitted since we're using JavaScript that's pulling things apart and displaying it we don't need that line to be displayed uh, so that's, I think that's the only difference is that I removed all these equal signs from being transmitted. And that's it. So let's go ahead and quit out of that. So we already looked at that code. Let's see everything in action. First thing that we need to do, uh, first of all, I'm going to, well, I'm going to try to start the server, which I actually think I started before I started recording the video and it will tell me, uh, yeah, it says the address is already in use, which means it's already running or you have another server running on that port. Um, but I will go ahead and kill all busy box and now I can try running that script and this time we'll say starting server server started and it will give me an address here I can right click that and say open it's a local host 
So there we go. You don't need internet access for this. You don't even need a network for this because you're just looping back to your current computer through a virtual network device. But that's it. Let's go ahead and look at that uh, code real quick, our start server. Um, actually, let me do it in Vim so it looks a little nicer. It's a bash script. It says starting server, and then we're going to get a start BusyBox's web server, the HTTPD, on port 8080. The uh, reason I chose 8080 because 80 might already be used by another web server, plus you don't need uh, you know, special permissions to run something on 8080 on most machines. The end end, the ampersand, ampersand here is saying, if this command is successful, then we're going to echo server started on this port. The pipe pipe, two pipes like that, means if this command was unsuccessful, it says server failed to start. So that way you know whether the server started or failed to start. And the fact that the port was already being used is already being put out by BusyBox there. But that's it. It's, 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 it's basically a one-liner besides the message saying starting this. this. This is really the code right here. The rest of this is just output for the user letting you know it was successful or not. So our server is running in the background now. Let's go ahead and look at what our programs we have in here. We have our HTML interface, then we have our client. Let's go ahead and look at our client. Let me make this full screen here, Vim client. And all we're doing is basically the same thing as last time. We're saying, you know, our server, we're, we're wait, listening for transaction transmissions. And this time, instead of using T and displaying it to the shell, we're just dumping everything in the file. And really, we could do both. We could have it go to the shell output and then also to the web interface. But I chose not to do that when I wrote this. Uh, mainly because I wrote this before I wrote the shell interface, uh, but uh, really the code from the from the last project would work the same because it's being dumped to the file, and the um, the HTML whoops is just checking that file, uh, and then of course we have well we already looked at our dispatch code, uh, so let's look at our HTML code here. Actually, let's let's run this first. Let's do this so that we can see. So down here I'm going to start up my dispatch. So, and then up here, I'll start up my client. Oops, there we go. So down here, we have our dispatch. It's waiting for me to give it information on units. So I'll say engine 24. And when you download this code, I probably already have some sample data in there. I removed everything but one. So you can see this is what each call is going to look like. So this is an example one. What engines are being dispatched or displayed here. Your street name, your address is the biggest thing because that's the most important. Get going there, figure out why you're going there later, but who's going, where you're going, why you're going, and when you were told to go. So that is uh, basically the same information we saw before, only instead of in the shell, it's in a nice little GUI. But now it's waiting for more information to come in. So I can say engine 24, medic 24. I can say that you're going to 555 19th Avenue Northwest. And I can say that this is a signal seven. And I'll go ahead and enter. So you saw it actually, unlike our shell, which displayed everything after it all came through, our um, HTML here tries to display as it comes through. It's checking every, I forget how many seconds I set it to. We're gonna look at the code here in a minute. Every second, I think it was, it looked like that. So every second it looks at our dat file, our, our data.dat file for whatever is in there. And right now I have new calls going to the bottom of the list. Um, so if you get a lot of calls, you might have to scroll down. Again, this, there, you might want the newest calls at the top, or if you're going to put them at the bottom, have it uh, automatically scroll to the bottom when new information comes in, uh, which could be annoying if you're trying to look at something higher up and new calls coming in, it's going to start popping you down to the bottom. Anyway, that's something that if you were to use this, you would figure out you know, what works best for your system. Let's go ahead and send another message. So I'll say engine 47. Uh, ladder 47, engine 40, squad 40, let's say 1414, um, Oak Street, and we'll say fire in attic. Attic? Yeah. Cool. So again, here. We should start, there we go. It came through eventually. <laughs> uh, you can see that it's displayed right there next on the list. Um, so let's go ahead and real quick, we're gonna look at two things here. I'm gonna kill both these programs. Our server's still running right now, just so you know. 
Um, so we don't need to restart the server, although if we were to try to restart the server, it would tell us that it's already being used. Let's real quick look at our dat, data.dat file, which is just a plain text file, which looks like this. And basically our JavaScript, when we look at it here in a second, is going to every so often look at this file and uh, break it down line by line and then separate it by these pipe symbols. So unlike the last one, if you were to put a new pipe symbol in there, it was, if dispatch was to put a pipe symbol in their dispatch, again, it would just mess up the formatting a little bit, but it's not going to, to make it unreadable or anything. In fact, we'll give that a try. But real quick, let's look at our index file. Uh, we just got basic HTML header stuff here. Um, and I just realized something that should be changed for sure. Uh, and I should change that. Anyway, we give a title here. Here I am calling some code, we're just calling jQuery and Bootstrap from the internet. I shouldn't be doing that. This whole scenario is the internet's down. I need to download that and put it in a subfolder of the server. That's all I need to do. So I just need to change that code. It will work exactly the same except for trying to grab that stuff from the internet. It's going to grab it from your local machine. Uh, so I do need to change that. Um, but that's, that's simple enough. Um, I'm not going to do that on video here because I'll waste your time. Uh, here we got some CSS. All I'm doing here, uh, that 10, that's just putting this little space in between each box. Because without that, these boxes are going to be, you know, touching each other. And I thought that looked bad. So I, I put 10 pixels in between each of those boxes. Uh, down here is our body. Uh, so basically we're making a body. Then we got a div tag that's the container. And then we got our rows, which uh, has the ID of cards. Coming up here. We got here, we got code saying, wait till the page is done loading, and then run the fun function uh, get data. And then we're going to say here, every uh, 1,000 here means one second, every second run this function. And what does that function do? It's our only real function here. Well, function standalone that's not inside this function. We're saying get, so we're going to get information from this file. It's saying, look at the dat file. Return everything in there as a variable called dat, and then take that and make it an array based on new lines. So each call is on a new line. Uh, then we're going to say, look at our cards uh, div tag, which was down in our body here. And here I'm saying just clear it out, make it blank. There's actually, I'm pretty sure there's a clear command, but I usually just do HTML and give it a blank, blank information there. But basically, we're clearing it real quick. And this may call, if you have hundreds of calls coming in, uh, that could cause problems because you'll see the screen flash as it's probably reloading them. Uh, but in reality, I, if I was to use this code in real life, I would set this so that it only returns um, the last 20 or 50 calls. I probably wouldn't do more than 50 unless the user requested it. Uh, but for example here, we're going to clear the whole screen and reload it real quick. Uh, simple enough. Here, So here we're going to say, in our array of data, which is each call is a new item, we're going to say for each of those, we're going to put it as a variable called uh, D. And then we're going to take D and make that an array based on the pipe character. So if you remember, our each line uh, was a new call, and then each call had a block of information divided up by pipes. The Everything before the first pipe is going to be the trucks. Everything after the first pipe is going to be address. Everything after the second pipe is going to be our notes. And then our timestamp is going to be the you know fourth column or everything after the third pipe. Then we're going to check here, is the address undefined? Because when it's doing this, the last line of the file is always going to be blank. So you'd get basically a call that just said undefined. And I'm just doing this so that that doesn't get displayed. I'm sure there's more than one way to do this. Um, so basically, no matter how many calls you have, this code here is going to be looking at each line, and the last line is always going to be empty, and we just don't want to display that. So as long as that's not empty, as long as there's an address being transmitted, and it can even be blank, just as long as it's not undefined. Um, if As long as it's not undefined, we're going to put this HTML code into our page, into our cards div tag. We're going to you know set its column width to 12. We're also going to give it a, a class of output. That's uh, what gives us, that's just basically for that 10 pixel separator that I put in the CSS there, but could be used for other things in the future. If you wanted to filter this list, you can filter all the outputs based on something. We're going to have a class of card, and then we're going to give it a header, which is the trucks, and then the title for it is going to be the address, 
And then the text for the card is going to be notes and time. And then we're going to close all that up. And then I, I actually put some uh, line breaks in here just for spacing. And that is our entire code, really simple. So basically, again, we're just going to get the information from this file, split it up line by line, uh, then we're gonna clear our page really quick. Shouldn't even see it unless, again, your output is a lot. Then for each line, we're going to split up each item in the line and give it, a, you know, assign it to a variable, and then display it on the page. That's our entire code. And that's what will give us if we here start up our dispatch again and up here start up our client code and down here I can say let's uh, engine 23 medic 23 444 Palm Street South and here we can say fall from uh, roof so someone was up on their roof door and the storm and got blown off I guess since we're talking hurricane scenario go ahead and transmit that come back here to our output here and we should get the output on the page here go ahead and troubleshoot this by opening up network oh there we go I don't know our our it seems like if we leave the page for a while our timer tends to uh, take a while to get restarted um, but it does eventually come through. And worst case scenario, you can always hit F5 to refresh the page, but they should be coming in. And that's basically it. Again, you know, in real real world scenario, if you wanted to use this, you would probably limit the a number of calls that are displayed and maybe filter it by truck. So, so I can say, hey, I'm engine 24. By default, only show calls that contain engine 24. Um, and again, I'm using the get command, checking every second. In real life, you could set up a socket server and grab this information real time, but it doesn't really need to be real time. Every couple of seconds is is fast enough, you know? Uh, so again, uh, this is part of a series, be sure to check out the full, oh, you know what, real quick, let's hear, uh, engine 22, let me do a pipe symbol here and say uh, medic uh, 22, and then give it an address of one, two, three, um, Apple Drive, notes this is a test and this in this case it will mess up our formatting a little bit uh, and actually our nights notes might be cut off so let's go ahead and do this so here you can see at our last call here down at the bottom uh, our our truck first truck is there our second truck is where the address should be our address is here our notes are here and then our date is not there so this is a little more important that the dispatcher in this case knows not to put a pipe symbol in there because if they put a bunch of pipes it's going to cut off a bunch of information um, of course you could add to the dispatch code to remove any pipes that the user types and that's the best case scenario don't put it up to the user to to not put pipes in there uh, mo I usually use pipes for this because besides programmers and developers <laughs> Normal people don't use the pipe symbol. They don't even know what it's called or where it is on the keyboard. Uh, but just in case, the dispatch code could add in to check each variable and remove any pipe symbols that are in them. Um, so again, this is just example code, proof of concept to get you going. Uh, it's up on GitHub, GPL license, GPL3. So be sure to um, check it out. I thank you for watching. Visit filmsbychris.com. That's Chris the K. There should be a link in the description of this video. Uh, there you can go to the support section. Support me through patreon.com forward slash metalx1000. That link's in the description of this video as well. Or through PayPal. Uh, I do thank you for watching. If you enjoy this, uh, be sure to like, share, subscribe, and comment. I appreciate you watching. And as always, I hope that you have a great day.